Well, God bless you, my beloved. This is uh, Sunday morning, the 6th of uh, November, 2022. And this is Minister S.M. Crockett, Jr. With the truth of the gospel, the truth of the gospel, we're coming to you with our weekly lesson. And we are still in the first epistle of the Holy Apostle John. The first epistle of John, the Holy Apostle of Jesus. Remember, Jesus had holy apostles. And John was one of the original uh, of the 12 apostles, 11 of them were holy, one of them was a devil. Jesus himself said it, not, not Crockett. So J John was one of the original apostles. And he wrote the gospel according to John, he wrote the three epistles of John, and he wrote the book, the last book of the Protestant Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ, what we commonly call the apocalypse, or the unveiling of Jesus and his power and glory. And kingdom. And so we're going to talk to you today from John 2, 12 through 14. John 2, 12 through 14. And the name of our teaching today is the young and the rested, not restless. The young and the rested, not restless. The young and the rested, the young and the rested. I'm going to emphasize a certain part of uh, that pericope of scripture, that portion of scripture. Uh, we're going to emphasize that. And uh, let's read it, then we'll pray. And then we'll go into the uh, we'll go into the lesson. First John two. I'm going to read from the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. I believe it's the 1995 version. And uh, First John two, and uh, he says, "I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are, have been forgiven you for His sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know Him who has been from the beginning." I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. So that's our passage for today. Let's pray, Father, in the name of your holy Son, Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord God, for sending your dear Son, Jesus, to die at Calvary's cruel cross for our every sin. Blessed be your name. He is our righteousness. Without him, we, we have no righteousness that you are bound to respect. Blessed be your name forever. Thank you for your eternal plan, your, perfectly, your eternally perfect plan, your perfectly eternal plan to redeem us through Jesus Christ and his shed blood at Calvary's cruel cross. Blessed be your name forever. We pray that this preaching and teaching and preaching and teaching all over the world would be would glorify your dear son, Jesus. In the glory, power, majesty, and dominion. We pray that as a result of this preaching and teaching and preaching and teaching all over the world, there would be a great manifestation of fruit and gifts and gifts and fruit of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be your name forever. Forgive us for our sins, Lord, for we do give in to the lust of the flesh, Lord. Help us to say no to sin more and more and yes to righteousness which is in your holy son Jesus Christ our Lord help us Lord in what we say and what we do help us to be living epistles Lord that known and read of all men through Jesus your son we pray we pray for the persecuted church all over the world bless them strengthen them Lord through Jesus your son amen first John 2 1 John 2, let me read it again. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, fa uh, children, because you know the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. So he deals with several classes of believers here. I have written to you, young man, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Uh, I want to emphasize today, so I'll probably touch on this lesson again at some time in the future. I want to emphasize today what Jesus said when he said, I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So I want to speak to you about um, the, the, the word of God abiding in us so we can overcome the wicked one. Uh, so let's begin there. We're again, we're in First John. I can't do the Zoom. for the, It's telling me on my work laptop that my Zoom has to be updated by, a, by an administrator. So I have to wait till I go back to work and let, it, and, and let an administrator up, update my Zoom. So 
uh, you know, my normal Zoom Facebook presentation that I do. I can't do that today. So hopefully by next Sunday, I'll be able to do that. All right, so I read to you from John 2, 12 uh, through 14. So we're speaking the young and the rested, the young and the rested, because in Jesus, we find peace. In Jesus, we find rest. He, he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take unto me, take unto you my yoke, uh, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He was telling people to throw off the shackles of legalism, the shackles of sin, the shackles of uh, satanic bondage, etc. So the young and the rested, the young and the rested. All right. So let's see if we can de uh, develop this theme. I want to, I want to, um, and I want to emphasize uh, the Gospel of Luke. I want to go from First John to Luke, chapter twenty-four. Now, after the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it says, "Now upon the first day of the week." Very early in the morning, they came to the grave, to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They were thinking he was still there and they were going to um, anoint his body. I don't know how they thought that because, remember, a large stone had been placed over the grave. So I don't know how they thought they were going to do this. Uh, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. These would have been angels. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? This would be the angels speaking to the people. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is, written, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, sinful men and be crucified, and the, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. Now I'm going to skip down a little bit. I'm going to go down to verse 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about sixty furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened, and it came to pass that while they communed together, and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And Jesus said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass here in these days? And Jesus plain ignorant here so he could get more information out of them he said unto them what things and they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him but we trusted it had been he which should have redeemed Israel and beside all this the day is the third day since these things were done in other words hey he said he's going to rise from the dead on the third day what's up Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, and found that even so as the women had said, but to him they saw not. Then Jesus said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So this is, I'm, I'm leading into the word of God, living and by, abiding in us. O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. If the word of God abides in us, we're not going to be slow to believe what the prophets and the apostles have written concerning Jesus and his kingdom. We will believe it. If, if the word of God abides within us with power and grace, authority, etc., we're not going to be skeptics about the Bible. We're not going to be arguing in, uh, against the inerrancy of Scripture. We're not going to be saying, oh, I'm not sure, this, that, and I'm not, I don't really believe that Jesus, this, that. And if the word of God really abides in us, remember what John said in his epistle. You, I'm writing to you, young men, you're strong and the word, abide, word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. The wicked one, of course, is Satan. If the word of God really abides in us as, as it should, those of us who are believers in Jesus here, I'm talking about believers in Jesus Christ. If the word of God abides in us, we're not going to be doubting God's word. We're not going to be saying, oh, I don't know, the white man might have written that Bible to, to bamboozle, you know, the slaves. And 
not if the word of God abides in us with power, glory, authority. You see that? Jesus said, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He rebuked them for not believing in his resurrection. They went to the sepulcher. They went to the tomb. He wasn't there. Certain women said, we went to the tomb. We saw these angels. He said he, that he wasn't there. And I realized in that day, in that culture, a, woman, a woman's testimony uh, was not valid in the court of law, etc. I, I get all that. But they had witnesses, and they saw with their own eyes that Jesus was not in the tomb, in the sepulcher. Remember, the stone had been rolled away uh, by an angel of the Lord. And then, and then they confront Jesus. They didn't know it was Jesus at the time. They're on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus um, 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 made it so they didn't know who he was. They thought he was just another traveler. Oh, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? You don't know what, what's been going on. Uh, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was mighty in word and deed uh, um, in, in, uh, in the presence of all the people and, and how our people turned him over to the Romans and they crucified him. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have written, spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? You see that? Do you not know what I told you, what the prophet said, how the Messiah would suffer? Isaiah 53 in particular, how Messiah would suffer and how, how the father would prolong his, his days and prolong his seed, et cetera, and exalt him. Uh, are, you, are you slow to believe the scriptures? You're going to be apostles. You're going to lay the foundation of my church. Shortly, uh, you you you're gonna you know Jesus is saying you you're gonna have to get out of this mental spiritual dullness here, and so what Jesus did, I wish I could have been there. Oh, if I could have been there, beginning at Moses and all the prophets. Glory to the Lamb. I don't know how long this took, but be, but Jesus, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, all the scriptures, beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself my lord that must have been a glorious uh, teaching preaching session beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went and he made as though he would have gone further remember at this point they still don't know that this is Jesus they think this is a wayfaring traveler etc and, and they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And so Jesus went in to tarry with them. Here tarry means to remain where they were. He went in to tarry with them, and it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, as he fellowshiped with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, because Jesus opened their eyes. This is what... This is like what Paul said to the Ephesians, that the eyes of your understanding have been opened. And anybody who's a true, a true believer, a true follower of Jesus, the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of my understanding have been opened. Our eyes are not open because of our own intellect. Our eyes are not open because of our own efforts. Our eyes are open because of the will of God through his love, his grace, his election, our eyes are open because of the illuminating power, the illuminating ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave to them. And their eyes were open and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, here's another indication that the word of God abides in you. They said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? Is the word of God, if you're a true believer in Jesus, the word of God should be a burning reality within you, a burning reality, a burning. What did Jeremiah say? It's like a fire, you know, shut up in my soul. A burn, it should be a, the word of God should be a burning reality within you, a burning reality. It's not going to be a burning reality to unbelievers. But if you are a true disciple, a true believer in Jesus, as John said to those disciples in his first epistle, I've spoken to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. If the word of God, if we are really disciples of Jesus, the word of God should be a burning reality within us. Did not our heart burn within us? Here, I'm not talking about heart burn because you ate too fast or you ate too much Thanksgiving food. I'm talking about a burning within you to, to 
to delve into, dive into God's word, to know Jesus, to know God more perfectly, to know the will of God more perfectly through his word. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Nobody can open the scriptures to you except the Lord. Nobody, no one, no preacher, no prelate, no pope, no pastor, no bishop, no deacon, no, no, no disciple. No one can open the scriptures to you except the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul meant when he said the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He was speaking to Ephesians who had been uh, uncircumcised Gentiles, who had been pagan, who had been caught up in pagan religion, who had been worshiping Diana, the goddess of the Ephesians, the fertility goddess, etc., and had been worshiping, worshiping other Greek and Roman gods. And now here they were, the Ephesian church, a church to whom God sent some of his best preachers, Paul, Timothy, Apollos, Aquila, Priscilla, uh, um, John had been a superintending apostle in the Ephesian church. God sent his A-list of preachers to the Ephesian church, some of his best preachers to the Ephesian church through the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened up to us, opened to us the scriptures? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. They rose to the same hour. They, they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together. The eleven, because Judas, the, 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 that uh, one who um, the, the devil infested, infiltrated, he had gone and committed suicide. They found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Okay, now, these same people are now preaching Jesus. <laughs> They wait. They had just a little while ago, you know. Uh, you know, they, they didn't know who Jesus was. He was walking right beside him. They didn't know he was, who he was. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And now they said, "The Lord is risen indeed, and has appeared unto Simon." Hallelujah. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known to them in breaking of bread. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, "Peace be unto you." But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold, my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. That's a very important point he makes here. Because teachings would pop up later that John dealt with in his epistles. Teachings that denied that God became flesh in the person of his son Jesus. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs for 40 days. Uh, being seen of about 500 brethren, Paul said to the Corinthians. And even eating with them, etc., fellowshipping with them, letting them handle his body. Remember, he let Thomas handle his body, right? He even said to them, uh, he said, uh, Behold, my hands and my feet, that is I myself, handle me and see that a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see that I have. And while when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet, which still had the marks of Calvary's cruel cross. And while they had yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, have ye any meat? Now he's going to eat with them. He's giving infallible proofs that he has been physically, not metaphysically, not metaphorically, you know, not, not psychologically, not the Christ consciousness, as Carlton Pearson, uh, for some reason, is talking about the Christ consciousness. He physically, literally, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. He physically, literally, had been raised from the dead. Children, have you any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. He took it and he ate it in their presence. He's proving that his resurrection was physical, was literal. It was a bodily resurrection too. too because he knew that these false teachings, of course his disciples, his apostles, they needed that infallible proof themselves because they would go on and preach and teach and give their lives in most cases uh, for what they believed. But also Jesus knew, being the perfect prophet that he is, he knew that teachings would arise, Gnosticism, uh, that, would, that would deny the reality of the physical, literal resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. That's the whole Old Testament. Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the Tanakh. That's the Old Testament. These things were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The Lord wants to open our understanding so that we can understand the scriptures. And the understanding can only come from the Lord. It can't come from our rational you know, thought process, our rational being, 
It can't. It can't come from us going to seminary. The understanding of the scriptures can only occur through the revelation of Jesus Christ, his gracious act of opening the eyes of our understanding. He says right here, then it says here in Luke 24, 45, then opened he their understanding that they might understand, that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, thus it is written and thus it behooved Christ. Let me go to the next page here. Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Remember, they said, oh, man, remember back on the beginning of the road to Emmaus? They said, man, it's the third day. He said he's going to rise from the dead on the third day. What's up? And Jesus said, okay, yeah, the prophet said, and I, I said, being I, I am the prophet of prophets, and I said I would suffer. I would be turned over to the hands of sinful men, and they would crucify me, but I would rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, a point that he reiterated in Acts 1. You will be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts of the world. And ye are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. They had to go to Jerusalem. They had to remain in Jerusalem in the upper room. They had to tarry in Jerusalem, if you will, until they received power from on high, which was the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit that they received on the day of Pentecost. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Remember they asked him in Acts, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you now take us back to the good old days of David and Solomon and Josiah, the good old days of Hezekiah, the good kings, etc.? Will you now take us back to the good old days when we were on top, not the Romans? And Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has said in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world. So, so this Luke passage here and that Acts passage, they, they, they coincide. That's why it's important when you want to believe biblical truth, you need, you need, you need more than one passage of Scripture to, to verify. The Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every truth is established. So you, 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 as, you, as you study the word of God, diligently study the word of God on a continuous basis, the Lord will open up and show you that his word is true. And that, and that as some people say, scripture interprets scripture. And what they mean by that is there's always scripture to bear witness with other scripture. The scripture here in Luke 24, 49, um, is, it, it has witness in Acts. And I'm sure in other places, but in Acts chapter 1. He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. The ascension, right? And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And then, of course, we if you skip John, then we go to Acts. And then in, on the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit um, um, fell upon them, if you will. All right, so let me spend a few more minutes on this lesson. The overriding desire to do God's will through Jesus Christ our Lord. The overriding desire to do God's will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, uh, I want to take you to John chapter 8. There's a passage that is often misquoted, and one reason it's misquoted is because the whole passage is not quoted. Jesus said uh, in John... I'm going to start uh, at verse uh, 28, John 8, 28. Here I'm reading from the New King James Version. Then Jesus said to them, when you lift up the Son of Man, meaning this is before his crucifixion, when you crucify me, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Faith comes by hearing, right? Hearing by the word of God, right? The truth shall make you free. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, if my word abides in you, if my, if my word continues to be a burning reality within you, you are my disciples indeed. You see, you're not a disciple of Jesus just because you mention his name. You're not a disciple of Jesus because you go to church. You're not a synagogue, a mosque, a temple. You're not a disciple of Jesus apart from the sanctifying power of his word. Saved by grace and then the sanctification process, of course, must take place. He says, if you abide in my word, then that's a true sign you're my disciples. 
Remember he said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Well, abiding in his word will produce that love. That love of God will spring from our hearts so that we can love people. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. A lot of people quote the part about you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They don't quote, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. They, they, they cherry pick that, as, as, uh, as often other scriptures are cherry picked. But a, a lot of people, you know, they, they quote the part about you're going to know the truth. Even politicians quote that. I'm going to tell you the truth about January 6th and it's going to make you free. Or Donald Trump might say, uh, you're going to know the truth about, you know, the election of 2020 and the truth is going to make you free. But they don't quote the part, if you abide in Jesus' word, then are you his disciples indeed. If you abide in his word, if you abide in his word, but we can't abide in his word if his word is not you know, internalized, right? If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered his critics, his Jewish critics said, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. Remember, his critics were depending on their Jewishness to uh, be right with God. John the Baptist had dispelled that, that fallacy back at the beginning of, during his ministry because they came to, because the Pharisees, some religious officials, Jewish religious officials, came to John's baptism to check him out, to see if he was claiming to be the Messiah, etc., and so John said, no, I'm not the Christ. I'm, I'm the one prophesied by Isaiah. Um, you know, the, the Lord is coming. Make, make a straight path uh, for our God. As, you know, Isaiah said that, I believe, Isaiah 40. No, I am not the coming one. I am not the Messiah. I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. So these people thought they were in tight with God because they were Jewish. And John said to them, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. Think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham as our father, as these people were doing here. For God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. I mean, in other words, your Jewishness is not going to be enough here. The axe is laid to the root of the trees, and those trees that don't bring forth good fruit are, will be cut down and cast into the fire. So they say to Jesus sometime later, we are Abraham's descendants have never been in bondage to anyone. And that, was, that wasn't true. They were in bondage to the Romans when they made that statement. And historically speaking, the Jews had been in bondage to the Babylonians, the Assyrians. Babylonian captivity, captivity, Assyrian captivity. Now they were in bondage to the Romans. I don't know how they would make that statement. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So the word of God, if it abides in us, it frees us from the slavery of sin. The apostles further uh, build on that doctrine in their epistles, Paul and Romans uh, um, 6 especially, about being free uh, from sin and to not, abuse, not abusing God's grace. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. And they would have understood that because they were slaves at that time to the Romans. And slavery was very common in the Roman Empire at that time. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. You hear that? People who persecute the Christian church, as Paul did before he got saved, people who persecute the Christian church, people who persecute the Christian church, if you're persecuting believers in Jesus, it's because the word of God has no place in your life. You're persecuting me or you're persecuting other believers. That's because the word of God has no place in your life. And so here's another sign that the word of God abides in us. We're not persecuting the church. We're at one with the church. We're at one with the true church, the visible, the invisible church, the true believers in Jesus. Not, not, not necessarily everybody who goes to the building on a particular day or morning or evening. But the true believers in Jesus, the true disciples of Jesus, those who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus is going to say later in Revelation, he's going to call those Jews who were persecuting other believers, he's going to call them a synagogue of Satan. He, Jesus would have been called an anti-Semite. He would have been up there. They would have been persecuting him with Kanye, Yi, Kanye, or whatever his name is. And, uh, and uh, the other guy, Kyrie Irving, they would have been persecuting Jesus. Because Jesus, he didn't call all Jews but he called those Jews who were persecuting believers, he called them a synagogue, a synagogue as a Jewish house of worship. He called, Jesus said, a, he called them a synagogue of Satan. 
that that's stronger than anything that Kanye Ye could say or, or Kyrie Irving. He called him, but, but again, he wasn't calling all Jews that. He was calling those, but he did say those Jews who didn't believe in him and were persecuting other believers and trying to dissuade them from believing in Jesus. Jesus, twice in Revelation, he called them a synagogue of Satan. So just to say something negative about Jews just doesn't make a person an anti-Semite. And I have not seen this documentary that uh, Kyrie Irving, uh, you know, uh, clicked on the link to, etc. I have not seen it. I've seen the title of it once, but I have not seen it. But to say something negative about a Jewish person doesn't make a person an anti-Semite. Neither does saying something negative about black people necessarily make a person a racist. All right, but I don't want to get caught up in that subject. But but Jesus, he called those Jews who persecuted believers vehemently per persecuted. If you go back to the book of Acts, uh, especially in Thessalonica, etc., Paul made the point to the Thessalonians, these, these, these Jews who were persecuting people to strange cities, from city to city. Paul had been that part of that group at one time when he was Saul. Paul was Saul. Saul was his Hebrew citizenship, his Hebrew name. Paul was his Roman. Paul had dual citizenship. Paul was his Roman name. And, and Jesus, not Crockett, not even Paul, Jesus, our Lord, Jew of Jews, of the tribe of Judah, the king of kings, David's descendant, hallelujah, the root and offspring of David, I feel like preaching. He called him a synagogue of Satan. That Crockett, Crockett can have a sharp tongue. Crockett, would, Crockett never said, what, a synagogue of Satan? Or it to God. Yeah, so I just thought I'd bring in that point. All right, so Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, okay, you believe in me? Come on and follow me. And, and let my word abide in you as this, as a, an, an, an overriding sign that you're my disciples. And part of that overriding desire for the word of God to dwell richly within us, as the Bible says in Colossians, is, the, is it's, it's all part of the sanctification process. It's all part of the sanctification process. Let me go to John 17. I'm going to close in a few minutes. Let me go to John 17. And in John 17, our Lord Jesus is giving account of his ministry before he was crucified. He gives an account of the Father for his ministry. And Jesus says, uh, I pray for them. I'll start at verse, uh, let, me see, let me start at verse uh, 13. But now I come to you, Father, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. Do you hear that? that? There's another sign that we, that the word of God dwells richly within us and that we are in the process of overcoming the wicked one. If the world hates us, now if the world loves us, something's wrong. If the world loves you, there's a problem. If the world is clapping his hand and heralding you and slapping you on the back, that's a red flag. That, that's problematic. Jesus said, I have given them your word and the world has hated them, meaning the unbelieving world. The world has hated. If you're a preacher and you're loved by the world, you're loved by everybody, oh, that, that's, a, that's a bad sign. That's a red flag. Apostles and prophets of God, preachers of God, are not supposed to be loved by the world because we speak truth to power. We speak prophetically, not politically. Don't get me started. Don't get me started. We speak prophetically. And if that preacher is more concerned about public policy and politics than about biblical prophecy, that's problematic. Jesus said, I have given them your word and the, word has, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, Father, by your truth. There's only one thing that can sanctify us, and that's God's word. Nothing else can sanctify us but God's word. Sanctify them, Father, by your truth. Father, don't let them walk in their truth. People say, I'm walking in my truth. I'm walking, honey, walk in your truth. If that truth is not according to God's word and the sanctifying power of God's word, it's a lie. And you're going to be a D, 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 D. You know what the other two Ds are. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, uh -uh. you're going to be in the abyss. You're going to be in the abyss of apostasy. Sanctify them, Father, by your truth. Then Jesus says, he leaves no ambiguity. Jesus, our Lord, says, your word is true. If, 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 
There's only one thing that can sanctify us. Men's outward intentions of sanctification do not do not work. Men's, uh, you know, you're sanctified if you go to church on a certain day of the week. No. You're sanctified if your dress is eight inches below your knees. No. You, it, it, it only takes a little bit longer to pull that dress up uh, above your knees if you get my drift. You're sanctified if you don't wear any makeup. No. You're sanctified if you belong to a certain denomination. No. You're sanctified if you can quote scripture. No. The devil can quote scripture. The, the, the devil is a better preacher than, than, than many of us. The devil knows how to preach. He came to Jesus preaching. He came, you know, when he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. He quoted scripture. So quoting scripture, that, that's good because it's a point of reference. And I will always defend that. There are preachers today who won't quote scripture. They don't want to offend people. They, they won't quote scripture. They won't quote where the scripture is found, etc. They don't want to offend you. I'm, I'm saying to myself, oh, that's a red flag. What do you mean you don't want to quote scripture? The apostles did. Most of the New Testament is the, re -te is the Old Testament requoted in New Testament context. The apostles and Jesus himself. Jesus said, according to the prophet Daniel, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, you know, let, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The apostles were all, always quoting scripture as it is written, as it is written, as it is written in the prophets, as it is written in the book of Psalms. Peter quoted uh, uh, the prophets. He quoted the Psalms in, in, on the day of Pentecost. Matthew, who wrote about the, the fact that Jesus is the promised Messiah, he, as it is written in the prophets, as it is written in the prophets, as it is written in the prophets, as it is written in the prophets. Most of the New Testament is the Old Testament. I don't know what percentage, but most of the New Testament is the Old Testament requoted. If you got a good reference Bible with those reference passages next to the passages of Scripture, you'll see most of the New Testament is the Old Testament requoted. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. That's a requotation of Isaiah. He would not leave my soul in hell, neither will he suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Peter quoted that on the day of Pentecost. That's from the 16th Psalm. It's a messianic passage of scripture related to Jesus as the Messiah and his bodily re and the promise of his bodily resurrection. He would not be left in the grave to see corruption, etc. And, and on and on and on and on and on. Paul, as it is written, you know, eyes have not seen nor ears heard, neither has entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared for them. He's quoting the Old Testament. I don't know the passage. It might be Isaiah, but I'm not sure. But he's quoting the Old Testament. Peter, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades away, for the breath of the Lord blows on it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Peter's quoting, the, uh, he's quoting Isaiah. I think, and I'm not sure here, I think um, it's either Isaiah or Psalms would be the most quoted Old Testament book. The book of Revelation has hundreds of allusions back to the Old Testament. It is said that it has no direct quotes, but hundreds of allusions. I've seen one estimate of 300. I've seen estimates, estimates as high as like five, 600. Allusions back to the Old Testament. When Jesus speaks to the seven churches, he talks about uh, clothe yourself with righteousness in me that the shame of your nakedness may not appear. That's an allusion back to the to, back to Genesis. When Adam and Eve were naked uh, and, and, they, and they, they ate of the, for, of the forbidden fruit and they saw they were naked and they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. That's what Jesus says. He says, to, I believe it's to the Laodicean church. Buy of me. I counsel you to buy of me. You know, uh, the, 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 the righteousness that, that's, I'm paraphrasing, the righteousness that's within me, you know, righteous garments, and so that the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. So, so you know, people today, I don't want to quote scripture. I'm not quoting because I don't want to offend. What you get sit down? <laughs> go walk, go work at Walmart. You don't want to offend. Why are you up there preaching? You can't preach the gospel and not offend people, because the gospel is the word of God. The word of God is quick and powerful. And, and, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit, of the joints and the marrow. And as a discerner, ah, that's, that's, that, that's where the rock of offense comes. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. When Jesus walked the earth, he was the word of God on two feet. That's why when people would do things, the Bible says, and Jesus knowing their thoughts. When, uh, uh, let me give you a passage, and I'm going to close here in a minute. It's in Luke, and I hope I can find it quickly. It might be in Luke 7, because I was trying to find it like last week. It took me a minute. Oh, here it is right here. In, in Luke chapter 7, 
Jesus, uh, he went to a Pharisee. They were always inviting Jesus to, to fellowship and dine with them. The problem is many of their motives were not pure. They, they were trying to trap him in his doctrine. and You know, they, they were trying to trap him. You, how are you going to trap Jesus? You can, you can trap Crockett if you try hard enough. You gonna, you're not going to be able to trap Jesus. How are you going to trap Jesus? The word of the living God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. So in Luke 7, beginning at verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, and that's the Bible's nice way, euphemistic way of saying she was a prostitute. Okay, A woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and he, she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. This is a woman of the city. The Bible, you know, for some reason they didn't just say a prostitute. Normally, according to Dr. Fruchtenbaum, a Jewish scholar, Messianic Jew, a Jew who believes in Jesus. When the Bible says a woman of the city, this is a, a euphemism for a prostitute. Okay, so she's at the Pharisee's house. Okay, all right. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. He didn't say to Jesus. He spoke to himself. He threw Jesus under the bus. He said, hmm, this man, talking about Jesus, if he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is who is touching him. You know, the Pharisees were very self-righteous. The word Pharisee means separated ones. But it doesn't mean separated in the sense of sanctification by God's Holy Spirit. It meant self-righteous separation. If this man talk about Jesus, huh, if he were really a prophet as he claimed to be, a prophet of Nazareth, you know, uh, the son of David, and, huh, if he were really a prophet, he would know what, what kind of woman this is. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out how the woman knew where to find the Pharisee's house. <laughs> Well, how that prostitute know where you live? Glory to God. And Jesus, knowing his thoughts, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, that was the Pharisee's name, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. This is a parable here. One owed 500 denarii. A denarii was a day's wages. So 500 denarii would be a little bit over a year's wages, about a year and a half wages. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with, with, with which to repay, the creditor freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon the Pharisee answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? The one who was the prostitute who washed Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears, etc. Do you not see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Because in those days, they walked the roads and their feet got dirty and the sandals got dirty, etc. And it was a job of a slave to uh, wash the feet of the person, uh, especially a high official who came into the house. The Pharisee probably wouldn't have washed his feet, but would have had one of his servants, etc. wash Jesus' feet. That's where foot washing comes from. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, she's a prostitute, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, go, your faith has saved you, go in peace. So the Pharisee said to himself, hmm. Yeah, he called himself a prophet. He just, this old skank, skank woman, you know, cuddling up to him. If he were really all that, if he were, you know, and Jesus, 
And in other places, it would say, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them. Because Jesus was the word when he walked the earth. The word was made flesh, hallelujah, to the Lamb of God. The word was made flesh, hallelujah, to the Lamb of God. I feel like preaching. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Every, everything Jesus did, not just the glory at the Mount of Transfiguration, although it would include that. Not just the glory of his resurrection, although it would include that. But we beheld his glory, everything Jesus did feeding the poor, feeding the hungry, casting out devils, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind, which nobody else had ever done. Certain miracles that Jesus performed, nobody had ever performed, including the, the, the great prophets of the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha, and even the, minute, even the miracles that Moses performed in the presence of Pharaoh. Jesus, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's, let's, let's take a moment and praise him. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Paul said, let your entire uh, spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the dividing of soul and spirit. Piercing even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit, of the joints and the marrow. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's why the word of God is despised so, because the word of God shows us who we are and who we should be in, in Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And so and so uh, the, the point I'm making is that Jesus, hallelujah, is that, is that living word. Jesus, is only that sanctifying power of God's word. His son Jesus, of course, through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Only that can truly sanctify. I'm talking about true sanctification. I'm talking about true sanctification, biblical sanctification. Not the sanctification that man brings. Come with me to Jeremiah as I get ready to close. Listen to what God said to Jeremiah. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. But because a, because a passage of Scripture is familiar does not mean that we shouldn't go to it continually because God's word is always fresh. It's like that fresh manna every day, right? The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Remember the, the 12 tribes, they all had land except the Levites. They didn't have any land. The Lord was their possession. So you had the land of Benjamin, the land of, of Zebulon, Naphtali, uh, Judah, etc. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Ju Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Remember those Pharisees said to Jesus, we were never in bondage to anybody. I don't know what they were thinking. You were in bondage to the Babylonians, the Assyrians. You were in bondage to the Egyptians for 430 years. I forgot to mention them. You were in bondage to the Egyptians, the, uh, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. And when you said that, made that statement to Jesus, you were in bondage to the Romans. What do you mean we were never in bondage to anybody? I don't understand that statement. I'm a, I must be missing something in the translation or something. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Ju Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. The word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah speaking, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, before you were born, I sanctified you. See, sanctification can begin in our mind on the, when we accept Jesus. But in the mind of God, sanctification begins in eternity, past. Because God is not bound by time like we are. I, I could tell you sanctification, you know, I could say it began on May 20th, 1979, because that's when I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I looking back, I see events that God was putting in place, like our grand chess master. There were events that God was putting in place to call, calling me and drawing me through his loving kindness. He was, and he was setting events in place. In my life. So in the mind of God, sanctification didn't begin on May 20th, 1979. God is not bound by time. Time is really for us, more so than for God. 
God is eternal. What, what, is, what does two years mean to God, right? One day, a thousand years, a thousand years, one day. God is not bound by time. Time is really for us and in our dealings, etc. He uses time in dealing with us. God is eternal, right? God is eternal. And so in the mind of God, what, what did God say to Jeremiah? Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before your mama became pregnant, before your daddy impregnated your mama, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. Then, then, and then Jeremiah said, oh, Lord, no, why, why me? My daddy was a priest. My granddaddy was a priest. Let, let me just be a priest to offer up offerings in the temple. please." God would often call prophets out of the priesthood. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, no, not Isaiah, um, John the Baptist. Remember, I, his daddy, Zechariah, was a priest. So God would often call prophets from the priesthood. And there were, I'm sure, other prophets whose names don't come in my mind right now. But I know Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and John the Baptist uh, came out of the priesthood. It says at the beginning of Jeremiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Because the Levites, you had to be a Levite to be a priest, but those priests will be scattered throughout all the other tribes, etc., ministering the uh, rituals of the um, of the priesthood of the of the Divi of the Aaronic priesthood. Don't get me started now on Jesus, our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. All right, let me move on here. If you confess with your mouth, if you haven't done so already, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God has bodily, literally, physically raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe unto righteousness and it is with your mouth that confession is made and you are saved romans 10 and 9 if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord and believe in your heart you see you can fool crockett but you can't fool god remember god is that word that pierces even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and when God sees that your belief is, is, is genuine, he imputes the righteousness of his son, Jesus. That is, that is one of, if not the most important doctrine in the Bible. Imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. That's when God says, although you are not righteous, you're a sinner. Crockett. But because you believe in my son, Jesus, I'm going to impute his righteousness upon you. Because he went to the cross to bear your sins I'm going to give, I'm going to place his righteousness upon you. That's called imputed righteousness. That would be the righteousness that uh, the Bible taught in the apostolic age until it was corrupted by corrupt individuals. It would be the righteousness, imputed righteousness, Romans 1 17, which is a requotation of Habakkuk 2 and 4. A man shall live by his faith. That's what got Martin Luther through the Holy Spirit, stirred up Martin Luther which ended, uh, which which um, uh, uh, developed into the Protestant Reformation. Remember when Luther uh, posted the 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, that a man shall live by faith, not by the works of the law. A man cannot be justified by the rituals of either the Protestant or the Catholic churches or whatever. That a man is justified by faith. We are saved by grace, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense through faith unto good works. The Bible does not uh, negate good works, but you cannot be saved by good works. You can only be saved by trusting in what Jesus did at the cross. My grandson, when he was like five, he saw a picture of a cross on a Bible. And he said, that's the cross where Jesus died for our sins. Believing that is salvation. Believing that, Papa. That's the cross. Hallelujah. He said to me, and when he was he's six now, he, so he had to be five then. Grandpa, pa, he calls me Papa. Papa, that's the cross where Jesus died for our sins. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, hallelujah to the Lamb of God, and only God knows the heart, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, and with, the conf and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. That's a quotation from the Old Testament. For the scripture says, for the scripture says, see, Paul is quoting the Old Testament. For the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon, I believe he's quoting Joel. Remember, Peter quoted Joel 
Uh, it shall come to pass in the last days, etc., etc. The, the, the Lord will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Young men would prophesy, old men would dream dreams. And on my servants and handmaidens are part in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and it shall come to pass. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So the New Testament, is much of it, I'm sure over 50% of it, probably over 75% of it, of the New Testament. And, and again, I don't know the percentage, but a, a good deal of the New Testament is the Old Testament requoted in New Testament context. In New Testament context. God bless you, my beloved. I pray that the word of the living God is a burning reality within you and that you are a disciple of Jesus in reality, not just in word, but also in deed. God bless you, my beloved. We'll talk again. So that was that was First John two twelve uh, through fourteen. If I may touch on those on that passage again, or I may go to fifteen and beyond. We'll see. But God bless you, my beloved. Have a good uh, week. Remember, Jesus is Lord. Go out and vote your conscience. Vote your conscience. Vote your conscience. Vote your conscience. That's all I'm gonna say. I want to say more, but I'm not going to. Vote your conscience. God bless you, my beloved. Eli. Now be careful right here. You got uh, uh, be, be careful. You got wires. Step over. All right. You, you know what to do there, right there. Press it. Wait for the blue. I press here. Mm -hmm. All right, and press the red. Press the red right here, right here.